a diagnosis of Castleman's disease really begins first with suspecting it. And so uh, it's a hard disease to keep at the front of your mind um, for most providers um, because it is so rare. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's a classic expression in, uh, in medicine, when you hear hoofbeats, you should think horses, not zebras. Um, and most providers on the front line, when they see a patient who has enlarged lymph nodes or constitutional symptoms, is not thinking about Castleman's disease. That's clearly the zebra in the herd, not the, not the horse. Um, so the first challenge is, um, is really knowing when you should suspect it. In my mind, there are certain risk groups who definitely need to be uh, considered as uh, more more likely to develop Castleman's disease. First and foremost, those are patients with HIV infection. Patients with HIV infection who are co-infected with human herpes virus 8 are at, very, uh, are at higher risk of developing Castleman's disease. Still not a high risk, but significantly higher than the general population. In those patients, I would say anyone who presents with enlarged lymph nodes, constitutional symptoms, uh, and un, uh, un, unexplained causes of anemia and thrombocytopenia, uh, or high inflammatory markers, you really have to consider a diagnosis of Castleman's disease. Really, unfortunately, the only other risk group that in my mind I keep at the forefront is patients who do have a family history of autoimmune inflammatory diseases or um, hemologic malignancies like lymphoma. And for patients like that, um, I also would keep in the forefront of my mind that there may be some predisposition within those, those individuals for a higher risk of Castleman's disease. Apart from that, it's hard to, to identify someone as having a higher risk for Castleman's disease just based on what they look like. Uh, there's a relatively equal distribution of men and women. Um, there is a, uh, it can be seen in all, uh, in all ethnicities, so it's really hard to have that picture of what, it, and all ages uh, as well. So it's hard to have in your mind a portrait of what you think someone should look like, and that's really what we do in medicine. We sort of profile people and think about what they are at risk for, and it's hard to do that with Castleman's disease. But certainly, the diagnosis starts by suspecting it, and I think that uh, certainly anyone who's had persistent symptoms um, of fever, uh, night sweats, enlarged lymph nodes, um, other constitutional symptoms, especially in the setting of having any abnormalities in their blood counts, and high inflammatory markers, those are patients that you need to suspect Castleman's disease in. One way that we can um, facilitate providers making a, a, a more prompt and more accurate diagnosis uh, of Castleman's disease is to incorporate um, the, uh, the, the, the disease itself in guidelines that are given to physicians for the management of many different conditions. Um, at present, there really aren't a whole lot of guidelines and recommendations around the treatment of Castleman's disease, mostly because it is so rare, but the National Comprehensive Cancer Network um, has included Castleman's disease in their diagnostic criteria and does have a series of algorithms for both the suspicion and management. Um, I think that it's um, important to think about these things, and guidelines are really a great way to familiarize clinicians, especially with these rare diseases and how to try and standardize the management of them. But I would think that the thing that is challenging about the NCCN recommendations around diagnosis of Castleman's disease is that um, all of the NCCN guidelines start with a box, essentially. It's a flow diagram, and it starts with a box with when you might suspect the disease. And if you look at the criteria that NCCN uses um, for suspecting a case of Castleman's disease, it's a very broad swath of the population. You know, it, it basically is anyone with a persistence of constitutional symptoms and some associated laboratory abnormalities. And unfortunately, I think that that, that applies to many more patients than actually will ever be diagnosed with Castleman's disease. So um, is it useful to have a broad set of criteria and have it in national guidelines that providers think about? Of course. Um, on the other hand, I think that um, it also highlights to me the challenges in trying to standardize or protocolize uh, the thinking about a very rare disease that can have very heterogeneous manifestations. Two other important tools in making a diagnosis for Castleman's disease are one, um, getting a piece of the tissue, the involved tissue, the lymph node, to make a pathologic diagnosis, and also uh, radiography to show the extent of disease. Uh, in my experience, uh, a CAT scan uh, with contrast and, and one applied broadly, uh, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, um, is sufficient to uh, both make a diagnosis and also quantify the extent of disease. Some providers find that it's useful to get additional information with a PET scan uh, or a PET CT 
Uh, I think the thinking is there that um, the uh, degree of heat or hotness of the, of the lymph node uh, may help to differentiate between infection, uh, Castleman's disease, and lymphoma. Um, but in my experience, actually, there, uh, there can be such overlap uh, and such a heterogeneity uh, in the avidity uh, on a PET scan with Castleman's disease that I personally don't find a PET scan to be very helpful in guiding treatment or making a diagnosis. So certainly a CAT scan with contrast applied broadly, uh, because again, I think lymph nodes can really be anywhere in this disease is, is, is essential. Um, and then pursuing a biopsy, I think, is also essential. Um, many pathologists will tell you that it's better to have an excisional biopsy as opposed to a fine needle aspirate. Uh, reason for that is that the architecture of the lymph node is very important. And from my perspective, I would say that um, it certainly is critical to do my first step in making a diagnosis of Castleman's disease is ruling out lymphoma because there's an overlap between those two diagnoses and lymphoma has much more severe consequences and needs to be treated much differently. First step in, in my workup is making sure they don't have lymphoma and typically that's an excisional biopsy of the lymph node, uh, things like looking for um, clonality or evidence of restriction of, uh, uh, of light chains. These are things that I think are critical in making the diagnosis of Castleman's disease, but also ruling out uh, other, other conditions. So for my, uh, for my money, an excisional lymph node biopsy uh, is much preferred to a fine needle aspirate, um, even though obviously from ease of obtaining the tissue, a fine needle aspirate may be, uh, may be preferred. But I think an excisional lymph node biopsy and a CAT scan of the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis are really important uh, tests in working up and diagnosing Castleman's disease.